introduce our panelists to you and, and uh, thank them and say welcome back to all of you. Um, as a home birth mom myself and as an advocate for the midwifery model of care and as an advocate for um, human rights and the, the right to make informed choices, I'd like to express gratitude for Ryan's clear and articulate re representation of the problems facing the maternity care system in Maryland and the United States. Your dedication and unflagging support for midwifery are making a clear difference and will certainly help us move forward and unbreak birth. I'd also like to express gratitude for the panelists who have all generously volunteered their time to be here tonight. With insight from their unique positions in the birth community, they each play a role in the process of unbreaking birth. I will briefly introduce them and their bios are included in your agendas. Alexa Richardson is at the beginning. She's a certified professional midwife and the president of the Association of Independent Midwives of Maryland. Catherine Salam, she's a certified nurse midwife, professor of midwifery, and she is starting a new practice at Chase Brexton Health Services in Baltimore. She also served on the 2013 Direct Entry Midwife Work Group. As did Alexa, actually. Together. <laughs> Together. <laughs> Together, yes, Alexa did as well, thank you. Celia Garcia Perez is a home birth mom and human rights advocate. Corey Cohen is a civil rights attorney home birth baby, and daughter of a certified nurse midwife. <laughs> Erin Fulham is a home birth mother, home birth midwife, and member of, of the Association of Independent Midwives of Maryland. Jeremy Galvin is the president of Maryland Families for Safe Birth, paramedic, and a home birth dad. Leslie Hill Jenkins is a home birth mother and midwifery advocate. Liz O'Shea is a midwife birth activist and home birth mother. And of course, Ryan McAllister, birth rights advocate and our illustrious presenter. Okay, so we're gonna open up the floor to questions and the way that we're gonna handle those is to have people walk up to the microphones that are in each aisle and ask your questions. You can ask them specifically of a person or we can direct them to a person and you all may volunteer as well if you hear a question that you would really like to answer. Okay, and I see our first person coming up. Hi, thanks for presenting tonight. So I was born at home, and then when I got pregnant, my mom encouraged me to have my baby at a hospital because she felt, oh, maybe that's a little risky and it'll be a little safer and maybe the doctors will be better informed. And I'm wondering if any of you would just like to address the question this idea of our midwives well-educated, can they handle an emergency situation? So I think that would be an excellent question for one of our home birth midwives. Do we have a volunteer? Erin? Um, well, I think that actually when people come to me and say that they are looking for a natural birth, and um, I say that's great. I think natural birth is wonderful, but the, the real reason that they should be coming to me as a home birth midwife is for most women. I firmly believe that the hospital is not as safe as home and that home birth is the best place for moms and babies <coughs> if that's where they want to be. And I know that's not everybody's choice, but it's certainly been my experience that home birth midwives are very attentive to the mom and um, the child she's carrying throughout their whole pregnancy. And if it's not safe to be at home, we don't want to be there either. So we take the time and um, training to be sure that everything is going great with the mom. And if it's not, then we can always transfer to the hospital if needed. So yeah, I would definitely encourage um, my children to have their babies at home if they want to. I'll add one thing to that too because I know this is something that comes up a lot is what happens in an emergency and I think Ryan made this pretty clear in his presentation but I think an important point is that it's emergencies happen more in the hospital that you're more likely to encounter an emergency in the hospital. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to expand on that. I'm a home birth midwife, and 
my daughters, uh, I have eight grandchildren and seven of them were born at home. And when my oldest daughter came to me when she first got pregnant, she said, I told her, I said, you can have your baby wherever you choose. And just because I gave birth at home doesn't mean that you have to. You need to weigh out what's right for you. And she did choose home birth, and she was glad that she did. So, but I think that also, as Erin said, um, it's, you know, it is a safer situation for the most normal, low-risk births. And uh, we certainly wouldn't want to try and have a baby at home that was in a high-risk situation. We'd definitely transport. So I was really happy that my children gave birth at home. I'll just add that I actually couldn't find a midwife at the time, mm -hmm. and I did end up having a, a, my daughter in the hospital. And I also wouldn't have been able to pay for a midwife. So I really appreciate the work that all of you are doing to help midwives be accessible to everybody. I'm going to hope that uh, what we heard from Ryan and uh, the impact that uh, CPMs can have on the situations that, in fact, they can avoid many of the difficulties that are in hospital births. Uh, but it seems to me that even if that's true, there are times when difficulties will occur. And what concerns me about that is what the integration between CPM and emergency situations in hospitals and obstetricians and how well that whole process might be integrated so that it isn't a case where an obstetrician at a, an emergency situation has got a cold set of facts uh, to deal with. So it's the integration, and I, I, I haven't heard of anything particular about how that would occur. Information integration, preparation of what if difficulties occur. Um, so if someone could maybe address how that may be planned or it is being done, uh, that would help. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That is um, a perfect question for Jeremy Galvin from Maryland Families for Safe Birth. He's been working on legislation um, the last couple of years, and that's an important piece of the legislation. So Jeremy, could you speak to this? Sure. So uh, what I do for a living is I'm a paramedic, and so my whole job is taking people from the outside of the hospital world to the hospital and transferring care in a professional and uh, cohesive and um, you know, quality manner. And so we already have the system in place in our state to transfer care from outside of the hospital to inside the hospital. Where it gets dicey right now is that there is a lot of tension between the medical model and the midwifery model. And so what we're trying to accomplish with our bill and in conjunction with AIM, the midwives, the consumers, the legislators, is to have a bill that creates a framework so that when a mom or a transfer, when a transfer needs to come into the hospital, that that is done in a seamless way. There are a couple things that work for us already. The hospitals have to take walk-ins. So all hospitals federally have to be able to take a mom in, provide stabilizing care, and um, with or without their ability to pay. It's a, you know, they can't just say, oh, hey, welcome, you're having a baby, uh, we can't deal with that, goodbye. They can transfer to another hospital, but basically any hospital with a labor and delivery is equipped to handle a walk-in. But we want more than that. We don't want to just be walk-ins. So um, one of the things that I know the midwives are working on right now are standardized transfer forms so that when they come into the hospital, um, the same information is presented in the same way that I'm required to have a standardized MIMS short form with all of the information on it. We want that same exact standard to apply to anybody who's coming in, um, you know, from a home birth or attempted home birth. Um, they should be able to give any information that the obstetrical world needs so that that care can be seamless. Little things like consulting the hospitals, letting them know they're coming, and the relationships and the trust that are built up between midwives and obstetricians who've worked together for a long amount of time. I know the doctors in the ER that I transport to. I know them all on first name basis. 
when I call them and say I'm coming to you with a patient, they know who I am, and they trust me to give the medications that are appropriate, and they're prepared for me when I arrive. That's not in place right now because of the tension between the two worlds, but I'm, we're hopeful that you know, over time, over decades, it didn't happen overnight when paramedics came to Maryland. Um, it didn't happen overnight when other professions came to Maryland, and it won't happen overnight with midwives, but we're very confident that um, we will be able to pull something off that will work well for moms in our state. Thank you, Jeremy, and Can I'm... Can I add something to that? I, Sally, I would like to add to that? Yes, as a home birth mom, that was one of my biggest fears, was what would happen if something went wrong and I had to be transferred to the hospital? Would, would this person know me, know my background? Um, it, was, it was frightening to me, but um, in my personal experience, having birthed with Mama's midwives, and Erin was one of the midwives, um, I knew that my, I would be safe in terms of inf uh, information transfer because my midwife would come with me to the hospital. So although she wouldn't have the privilege to practice midwifery in certain uh, circumstances, she would be there as an advocate for me to give information to the attending physician so that I could feel safe and know that my records, which were, are with them on their portable laptop, would be given and um, be made accessible to the doctor who would have to attend to me at the hospital. Thank you. Would anyone else like to reply to that question? I'll just add um, that, I, I mean, I think you've identified one of the most important points and that this is the, the, the transfer issue is the thing that makes the criminalization of midwifery, um, you know, so dangerous for moms and babies. And the situation that we have mm -hmm. right now, it really is, a, it's a real problem and a real threat to safety that, you know, when I'm at home with a mom and we're starting to see signs that maybe it's time to transfer, you know, my, my heart's racing about going in and being present, you know, being caught or outed by doctors in that kind of situation. And I go with my moms and I support them in every way as best I can, um, but it, it really limits um, the ability to give that kind of integrated care when it's criminalized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I have an anecdote that kind of works with this last question. I, I was an emergency transfer from home birth, and um, it was a surprise breach. My midwife wasn't there before, and like it, it was my fault. Like There was no errors, and transfer went really well. The hospital treated me nicely. Neonatologist was a little off, but um, it can be good. Uh, but that's not my question. So uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, came to home birth from a very um, research-oriented, like um, I want to see the data, I want to see the studies position. And uh, you know, I see the studies, I know how to interpret the data, so I see the safety in the big statistics. Um, and that's where you have to measure safety. But I don't know how to have the conversation, and I've been trying for a couple years now, with people that, that say, yeah, but what if? Um, the anecdotes of high-risk situations loom so much larger than the real data um, that I don't know how to have that conversation with people. So you guys are much more experienced. I'd love to hear how you have that conversation. And then, like, to people who don't know about midwifery, so you can spread, spread the word. And then the second part is when the data doesn't exist, like in the case of home VBACs, um, what do you do and what do you think about it? <laughs> okay, so I'm hearing a couple of questions there and, and I'm really <laughs> grateful. I, I, um, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and the questions. So I'm, so I'm hearing that you come from a science background and that you're, you've enjoyed and appreciated the research that you've been able to do and that it, it convinces you and you're wondering how to share that in a way um, with people who might question your judgment at making these choices? Um, that's the first question, okay. Does anyone want to take that one on? Is that the what if question? <laughs> that's exactly the what if question. What if something goes wrong? I'm, I'm pretty good at the what if question. <laughs> Jeremy, we'll give you first off shot. The, uh, the what if question is the easy, you know, defense of it. Well, what if? You know, something happens. And, you know, for me, that was a big question when my wife said, hey, I want to have a home birth. Well, what if? I'm a paramedic. Uh, um, you know, we play the what if game throughout our entire lives. 
you know, with everything we do, with when we decide to turn our children around in safety seats, when, when we decide to let them walk to the store for the first time, when we let them do all kinds of things, whether we drive or not. You know, the, when it comes to birth, you know, what if you go to the hospital and at, you know, three or four of the hospitals in our state, such as GBMC or and, um, a few of the others who have 45% C-section rates, what if you are a perfectly normal low-risk birth who gets, you know, put into a unnecessary C-section and then you plan on having four or five more kids. What if those subsequent births are all C-sections because you just decided to go down that path? I mean, this is, these are the questions that we have to weigh, you know, and way more women are pushed on this responsibility than men because we like to play the what-if game and then you all have to decide what you're gonna do. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had to come to that place where I had to think, well, there are things that can happen everywhere. And, you know, my big what if was, well, you know, imagine if, you know, what if my midwife was good enough to see those problems before they happen and get me to the hospital in a timely manner? And if that is possible and you do enough research and you are comfortable in that decision, then you're setting yourself up for success, in my opinion. And, you know, it's hard. Some people you'll never convince. I will never convince 99.999% of all the OBs in the world that this is a good idea. <laughs> I've given up trying, it's okay, you know? And I, I won't convince some of my mother-in-law, will never be convinced it's a good idea, she was an ICU nurse. You know, so it's fine, you, know, you just do your best and it's, ultimately it's about making an informed decision for yourself. Exactly, thank you, Jeremy. And I think that's a, a really important point for us all to take home is, is this informed decision for yourself. So, and I'm sorry, I lost the second question. <laughs> I was so engaged in Jeremy's response. Um, do you want to share it with us again? Sorry, so the safety of um, home birth for low-risk women is well established in the data, but not for VBACs. And I just wanted to know if any of you had any comment or wanted to talk about that. So yes, who wants to speak to the VBAC question? Is it safe? Is it safe to VBAC at all? Is it safe to VBAC at home? And that would be a good place to start. <laughs> be back, vaginal birth after cesarean. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so, I mean, one thing that we've seen with vaginal birth after cesarean is that the data that is there, which is only on hospital births, has changed and shifted and changed and shifted so much. Um, you know, the, the opinions on it have changed and shifted over the last 20 years. So. There's a lot of unknown about a lot of these issues, whether you're in the hospital or not in the hospital, and a lot of varying opinions out there, which is why, at the end of the day, each woman needs to make the choice that's right for her. And informed consent, decision-making is like the core piece of midwifery care and independent midwifery, where an independent midwife only works for the woman. She doesn't work for a hospital. She doesn't work for you know, a doctor or any other institution. She just works for that woman. And what's right is what's right for that woman. And so there are unknowns out there, and there are decisions that need to be made. But institutions and public you know, health regulators and groups like that are not the right people to make those choices for women because there isn't the data available for us to really know. Okay, I think one, one place you might be able to look for the data, and I apologize because I have not reread the study recently, but the first National Birth Center study that came out was done during the era when women with one previous C-section were candidates for um, out-of-hospital birth in a birth center. And I believe that first National Birth Center study does include d data on VBACs in the birth center. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. We, we do have some studies that show that a number of these more higher risk births are as safe, if not safer, in homes or out of hospital or in birth centers than in the hospital. Um, there's a study out of Canada that, on twins that just came out the other day showing very clearly, with definitive enough information, that having twins vaginally, as opposed to just automatically you know, doing a C-section, um, has better outcomes. And it's revolutionizing in some circles in Canada um, how obstetricians look at delivering twins. Um, so, so studies come out. They pop up and they, you know, one side 
says, yes, this is the greatest study ever, and one study says, oh, this is complete garbage. And so it's, you know, it's an interesting and complex issue. So um, in Ryan's presentation, we heard uh, that cesarean rates and intervention rates at birth centers are much uh, lower than at hospital-based care in similar groups of low-risk moms. And we also heard that that care is less expensive than hospital care. So my question is, why do we not have independent birth centers in every region in Maryland? I'm thinking this might be a question for you, Catherine. <laughs> Well, I, th I think that it would be wonderful if we could. Um, there, I think, first and foremost, there are workforce issues with establishing birth centers and staffing and running birth centers. I know as a uh, midwifery educator, most, uh, most if not all of our students do want to have out-of-hospital experiences in a birth center or home birth setting, but when it comes to practicing midwifery, you do, they do have to weigh, um, establishing a birth center involves long hours for low pay. Most birth centers are established along a private practice model, so that means high, um, high cost of liability insurance and low reimbursement. And, um, they are also, you know, it, the issues, which are issues that, so that actually face a lot of practitioners um, in terms of making a practice run. So birth centers are, have the resources of the American Association of Birth Centers in, in terms of um, training for how to start a birth center, how to manage a birth center, but it's still, um, it's still a challenging situation financially and staffing-wise. I'd like to speak to that as well. I, I feel like if, um, and I hear what Catherine's saying, mm -hmm. and I understand about the workforce, but that's, a, that's the point of legalizing certified professional midwives in all 50 states, because in the states where they are legal, there are birth centers. Mm -hmm. popping up everywhere and and they are being run by CPMs alone by CPMs and CNMs I practice with with a partner who's a CNM myself and that's one of the things we've talked about and I think that there is a whole workforce there waiting to work we just need to get the laws in place to allow them to do their job so it sounds like this is another piece of uh, legislation that we need to change. We need to make this more possible. Did anyone else want to speak to the issue of birth centers? I, I just do have to say um, that I totally um, support the birth center concept and have worked in most of the birth centers in the area. Um, but I do sometimes think they're held out as being safer than home birth. There is nothing in any of the birth centers that I have ever worked at that we did not bring to a home birth. So certainly people might have reasons for choosing a, a home birth um, and certainly have reasons for choosing a birth center birth or a hospital birth. So it really is a matter of choice. But I sometimes see the safety statistics out there as if um, birth centers were safe and home birth isn't. And there is really no difference. There's just nothing in a birth center that midwives don't bring to a home birth. And Erin, what is, what is um, a cesarean rate for home birth midwives? I mean, uh, um, for, for your practice, for example. For you our probably practice, speak to that. it's, um, you know, about five and a half percent. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a very, very low number, and, and the number in, in birth centers is also low. Yeah, um, I think most birth centers have a pretty low um, rate, too. Yeah, I think, Ryan, you might have spoken to that number. Do you recall it? Uh, One in 16, was that it? That was the National Birth Center Study 2 statistic. Okay, I, I okay. I think there's a number of statistics, so they range a little bit. But right. Yeah, it's very low. 
Right, so still, still a very low number compared to one in three. Uh, one in three women right. going in for cesareans, one in 16 women going in for cesareans, and, you know, 5% rate at, um, and I'm not quick enough to... One in... One, one, one in... <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, there is a little bit of a difference there. So would that indicate even, you know, maybe in some circumstances a little less intervention? Um, I don't know. Yes, I'm wondering um, if you can speak to the differences between, uh, I see some, some certified professional midwives, certified nurse midwives, uh, direct entry midwives, and in particular, I'm from Virginia, so I'm a little more familiar with, with the structure down there, but how does Maryland treat the, the different uh, types of midwives differently? Wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, who, who would like to take a, a discussion on the difference between a CPM and a CNM? And then the secondary part of that question being, how does Maryland treat those two <laughs> titles differently? So that could be different people answering the questions. I'll talk a little bit about CPMs and CNMs. Um, our, our group AIM has both CNMs and CPMs in it, so there are a ton of similarities when it comes to out-of-hospital nurse midwives and professional midwives. Um, I definitely struggled when I was first deciding which route to go myself, and I took all my nursing prereqs and thought I would become a nurse midwife until I realized that if I did that, almost all of my training would happen in the hospital. And I really wanted to learn home birth, and I really wanted to learn the model of care that Ryan did a really good job of describing, which is, you know, revolves around um, a woman and her needs instead of around, you know, constraints placed by institutions and policies and liabilities and all these kinds of things. So um, certified professional midwives train exclusively out of hospital. And um, their training is very um, clinically based and very in depth with a lot of a lot of births. And when they're at those births, they're sitting through those births from start to finish, and they're learning all kinds of intangibles that are happening in, in those moments, which I, I think a lot of nurse midwifery training misses out on because by virtue of the hospital environment being a place where there are lots of people in labor and you're coming and going and all that kind of stuff. Um, nurse midwives um, learn a lot more about you know, pharmaceuticals and kind of medical management models, and they learn um, a lot more about well woman care, so they do more kind of whole care that way, whereas certified professional midwives really focus on the holistic, non-interventionist care during pregnancy and are most expert at that. Um, so I hope that kind of answers. Um, Maryland is really a hard place to be a certified professional midwife right now, and we are one of six states left that prohibit um, certified professional midwives. In fact, it's a felony to attend a home birth as a, as a non-nurse midwife in Maryland right now. So we have a long way to go, but we're fighting really hard, and I'm so moved to see everyone here tonight and out and supporting that, um, that purpose. Catherine, I'm wondering if you would speak to what a nurse midwife, um, some of the training of a nurse midwife and, and a hospital-based midwifery program, because that is another valuable piece of, of, of the whole midwifery profession. Home birth is wonderful, and we want to have midwives available to attend women in their homes. Midwifery needs to be in hospitals, too. It needs to be in every hospital. And I think that you're in a, a tremendous place to, to share that information with us. Okay, thank you. Well, um, in, in terms of education, um, the nurse midwife comes from a background of nursing. In some instances, such as myself, I went to nursing school in order to become a certified nurse midwife. So it did appear like a little bit of going over to point C in order to get to point B. But, you know, it does um, provide a good background for, as Alexa said, some of the broader scope of practice in terms of well woman care and primary care and care throughout the lifespan for um, women and families. Um, so the nurse midwifery program then is a graduate program after um, earning a bachelor's in nursing, then you would go for a graduate program in midwifery. Um, and um, similar to the CPM, we take a national certifying exam, 
and become certified, and then that makes us eligible for licensure by the individual state, okay? Um, some of the states, I would say most of the states still at this point require a um, collaborative agreement with an uh, obstetrician who has privileges at a hospital. The Maryland Board of Nursing actually is currently working on changing the regulations to eliminate, we eliminated the need for a signature a couple of years ago, but now we are working on eliminating the need to even name a doctor who will um, be our official backup or collaborator. So we are moving closer to independent practice in that, um, in that sense. In terms of education, like I said before, the, most of the women and the few men who come into a graduate program in midwifery are looking for out-of-hospital experiences. And as, as educators, we do our best to provide access to, you know, to those settings so that they, you know, students don't just get the hustle and bustle of the hospital, but also get to labor sit and be with the family from beginning to end and have continuity of care. So that is one of the goals of every nurse midwifery program is to provide, to provide access. Um, the one advantage then to being certified and licensed is the ability to practice in a variety of settings. And um, that, you know, that, that happens a lot, although um, I'm sure Erin can speak more to some of the difficulties of setting up a home birth practice as a certified nurse midwife. I, add a, I just want to add a couple things about the CPM because, okay. um, so I, my mom's a CNM. I don't, I didn't really know that much about CPMs until I started working on midwifery issues, and I think that there is a myth out there like CPMs, you can just be a CPM. And it's just, it's not true. It's a really, really rigorous um, credential. And when I first saw the package of, like, I don't even know what it's called, it's this book that's like this big, you have to check off, you have to get a mentor to check off that you can complete every single standard. And then you have to take a really long exam and you have to do all these things everything I mean if you go to the NARM web website you can find everything that they have to do but it is really really rigorous and intense and you have to attend a certain number of prenatal visits a certain number of postpartum visits a certain number of births a certain you have to actually a you know, assist some and then actually be the lead person I'm looking at Alexa because <laughs> I don't know um, all the details, but it's really impressive. And if you just look at it once, you're gonna be like, okay, these people know what they're doing. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to add to that is that the it's not just this title; it's actually a, a credential, and it's a, the credential is accredited by a national accrediting board or body that does almost all of the other health certifications and credentialing. So it's. Um, I think that's just something that's important for people to know, and most people don't know that. So I can't decide just to be a midwife and go put a CPM after my name? <laughs> yeah, I know, isn't that And catch crazy? babies? Yeah, okay. Or see it after my name and yeah. catch babies. I have, to, I have to do the work. I have yeah. to study. I have to, I have no, to yeah. go to birth. True, yeah. Wow. And I want to just also add that um, I'm so proud of my baby. But aside <laughs> from that, um, that, um, that I actually have trained under, when I was becoming a midwife, I trained under direct entry midwives. I also trained under um, uh, nurse midwives. And as a midwife myself, I have um, actually trained nurse midwives and I have trained CPMs. So I've had a pretty good chance to see how the training goes from all the different perspectives. And I can, I think that you have to choose the path that works for you. But there is no doubt in my mind that um, the students that I have had, um, you know, it, it depends on, on what they're putting into it, what they're going to get out of it. And I honestly have seen um, 
some nurse midwifery programs that are not as rigorous as the certified professional midwife program. And so I, I feel a little discouraged when I hear the um, PEP process um, t dis dismissed as being ineffective when there are, are nurse midwifery programs that will let you be a midwife if you've only been to 20 births. That is crazy to me. So I think that um, I think that it's it really is um, reasonable for women to choose their um, path to midwifery, but let's value and let's look at what they actually come out at with it. If they are if they are capable and they pass the test, let's acknowledge that they. That, they, that we all learn in different ways. And as parents, we all see that our children learn in different ways. So let's acknowledge that as a society. And I'll just add one more thing quickly, which is that both CNMs and CPMs are required to attend more births than OBGYN. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. If, uh, if I could just toss one little piece out as well. Um, there's a big difference between the world of academia and the world of apprenticeship. And what you're hearing a lot of these differences between CPMs and how they train and nurse midwives and how they train is largely the majority, one handles their training in an apprenticeship, whereas the other handles their training mostly in academia. And I think wow. if you live in academia, as my dad, who is the college professor, would say, uh, you know, you don't always recognize, you know, the flaws because you are surrounded, kind of like fish don't see the water around them. And so... There, you know, we don't jump into elevators and think, well, gee, I hope the apprentice who worked on this elevator, you know, is trained to a good enough safety standard. You know, we just kind of assume, and we, we have been ingrained that apprenticeship programs, almost every job in the military is an apprenticeship program. You learn as you go. You know, my profession is, is a mix of both. But, you know, it's hard to convince the institutions, you know, which are very, very in favor of one model over the other that, you know, that an apprenticeship can be the same as sitting in a brick and mortar classroom. You know, when you have schools like Hopkins and University of Maryland and the medical, we are, we are very lucky in our state in some ways that the university systems that we have are pretty good. You know, we have big schools, Hopkins, some of these big ones in DC, and they do a lot of good things and they have a lot of power and they don't always like to see apprenticeship programs given the credit that they deserve when many, many, many professions in our society are doing excellent work by that method of learning. The other thing I was just going to touch on was it's important to understand collaborative agreements and what that actually means. It's important to realize that you're allowing a profession that opposes another profession to sign a paper or give permission for that other profession to exist. I just kind of want everybody to think about that for a second. You know, I mean, you're allowing a profession that doesn't approve of home birth midwives to say yes or no to whether or not they're allowed to practice. It doesn't take very long to realize that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's one of the reasons we don't have as many nurse midwives in our state doing out-of-hospital birth, because it's very, very hard to find an obstetrician to agree to work with you. And we are extremely blessed that we have the three or four, however many it is now, who are doing it. Um, we're very lucky to have those obstetricians who are willing to, in some ways, stick their neck out in their community um, to do the service that, you know, allow the service that these women are providing. I think this would be a really good place to um, ask a question that was given to me earlier, um, someone who wanted to have this question asked, and, and that question would be um, that many of the hospitals don't have midwives in them. Why is that? Does it have anything to do with collaboration? All right, I think, um, again, workforce issues are very, um, very much in the forefront when it comes to availability and accessibility to midwives. Um, as of 2012, in the whole United States, there were about a little over 13,000 certified nurse midwives. Traditionally in Maryland, I don't have the most current figures, but generally it runs a little bit less, a little bit more than 200, okay? So, so basically, we're spread pretty thin. 
Although each year for the past, um, for the past couple of decades, there has been increase in the number of uh, nurse midwives certified. So that's one issue, is there just not enough to go around. Um, another is that it, you know, it is difficult for midwives to have their own independent practices. Um, only about 7% in, in the latest ACNM survey actually owned their own businesses or worked in midwifery-centered practices, which does address what um, someone down there mentioned earlier that, um, you know, legalizing C CPMs would lead to a growth in birth centers. And then you have the culture that really, if you look at the majority of women and families in the United States and ask them the question that Ryan posed during his um, presentation of, you know, uh, when you think of a midwife, what comes to mind? They're, most people either have no image or um, probably a negative or a very stereotypical image of what a midwife might be. So, you know, there's the cultural implications. Um, the other issue, of course, is policy. And um, policy has to do with legislation, and um, it also has to do with hospital bylaws. The, the individual institution of the hospital itself is very powerful in terms of who can and who cannot practice there. So even, even if the, reg the requirement for a collaborative agreement is dropped in the legislature, I happen to be at this very moment going through a hospital credentialing process for at a new hospital, and let me tell you, the language is supervision, and it's, it's very demeaning the way you know, you're treated to apply to a hospital setting. So there are barriers, but they're not insurmountable. And again, the, you know, as the gentleman addressed in the earlier question, the, the um, goal would be a seamless transfer of care so that women would have access to the level of care that's appropriate for them at whatever stage of their pregnancy or their um, birth occurs. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just say that um, Catherine, I am very grateful for the work that Catherine has done in the hospital setting. She was working at the hospital that had the lowest C-section rate <laughs> in the state of Maryland and it got closed down in June, sadly to say. On the other hand, I do also want to say that, um, especially in D.C., there have been some really um, um, wonderful midwives who have been working um, to develop um, a, a midwifery model of care where they actually are teaching the residents mm -hmm. and they are, um, they are doing um, vaginal breech births, they're doing twin births, so there is, there is, um, you know, there's the bad news of Maryland general closing, and then there's the good news that there are, um, there, there is the the pot is stirring, and, and things are getting better in some places too. So change is in the air. Yes. And and this is part of yes. it. Yes. Right. So one one more thing I did want to say in terms of you know practicing in the hospital with all its challenges and frustrations, is. The majority of American women do give birth in the hospital, and I would say the majority of inner city, medically underserved, socially disadvantaged hospital um, women give birth in the hospital. As was noted in Ryan's presentation of uh, the racism in society impacting women's um, birth choices and birth and life experiences. So as a midwife practicing in an inner city hospital, I feel like I can do some good by giving these, helping these women have a birth with respect. Thank you. Helen. This question is for the uh, parents on the panel who have chosen home birth. Uh, what were the reasons uh, behind your decision? I had a hospital birth. <laughs> 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 when I um, got pregnant with my first, Hospital birth was my, what I thought was the only choice out there. I didn't know there was another option. I didn't know anything about midwives. Everyone I knew had gone to the hospital. 
Um, and I thought that's what you were supposed to do. I thought that's how birth happened. And I went to the hospital. Um, it was disrespectful. Um, I was um, I was treated disrespectfully. My husband was disrespectful, disrespected. Um, as a woman of color, because I did not have on my wedding ring, I was pregnant, my hands were swollen, they assumed we were not married, so they never um, asked his consent for anything, even when I was in a position I couldn't speak. Um, I had a whole slew of interventions that I didn't need that <clears throat> almost resulted in a C-section, but my beautiful little boy, who has taught me so much, um, decided to come before the doctor could get in the room to give me that C-section. Um, so, and afterwards, when I got to my room, it just, it continued. It was the whole hospital experience. It wasn't just the birth experience. When I went into labor, they told me I couldn't eat. And then when I got to my room, they said, oh, you missed dinner. So there's no food. <laughs> so I went a full 24 hours with no food. Um, I was supposed to have a private room. They said, oh, we don't have any more private rooms. Sorry. Um, so I was put in a ward until my doctor, my OB, showed up the next day and said, no, she shouldn't be there. We should move her. Um, but I think that was more about they assumed who I was when I walked in the door with brown skin and braided hair um, than anything else. Um, I was pressured to do things to my son that I didn't want to do. I was. Um, he had trouble nurse. I had trouble nursing because he was sleepy because I'd had spinal anesthesia in preparation for my C-section, um, and they told me I wasn't going to be able to take him home until I could feed him. So they had to give him a bottle, and I told them, "No, that's it." And I signed out AMA. Um, and when I signed out AMA, they just wanted nothing more to do with me. They I, they let me walk out the door by myself. Um, it was a hard experience after, you know, there's five years between my children because there was some counseling that had to go on. You know, at one point during my birth story, I was naked on a bed on my hands and knees with 15 residents looking at my body, at my naked body that I, I'm sure you can all just, from my appearance here, realize I'm a very conservative person. I don't show my naked body to people. <laughs> um, so, I decided I wanted to have another baby. I did some research and I said, okay, I'm gonna have a, a midwife. I couldn't find a um, midwifery practice that would respect my desires at the time. Um, and so I searched very, very hard and was lucky to find a home birth midwife and had a completely different experience. <laughs> Leslie, thank you for sharing your story with us. It's moving and heartwarming to, to know that, that you took the action to, to make a different story for yourself and for your children. And, and you're sharing that with everyone here is, is making a difference for them as well. So thank you. Yeah. Celia, can you sure. share as well? My experience was, was a little bit different from Leslie's. I think she mentioned that she thought that was sort of the normal thing to do. People had to go to the hospital. That's just where you had to, to give birth. And in my case, I really didn't know another way in that um, my sister is a CPM practicing in Oregon. I was a home birth baby. So my mom gave birth to me illegally in California 30 years ago because she wanted to have a natural birth and there wasn't a doctor that could give her that birth that she wanted. So she chose the midwife. So to me, that was just sort of the normal way to have birth. And so I wanted that for myself. And I knew that it would be the safest thing for me and my baby, just thinking before I sort of read everything that I read and that my sister kind of funneled my way when I became pregnant, I thought, you know, giving birth in a sterile environment that's yet laden with all these germs and bacteria really isn't where I wanted to bring my precious little baby into the world. Um, I also believe very strongly in a woman's right to birth the way she wants to birth. I think it's uh, the most fundamental human right there is, is to give birth and create life in a way that's empowering for yourself. And I knew that in a hospital, that power wouldn't be mine. So I thought my house is under my control, so I can, you know, I have a certain 
amount of um, strength in what I'm going to be doing in my own home. And so the, the birth, home birth setting offered me that right. Um, also, as a feminist, I feel like it would also be the most empowering for not only me, but my husband. He would have more agency in that his voice would be heard. He would be part of that process of decision making, and he would feel like that was his domain as well, so he wouldn't be excluded from that birth process. So it was just the most empowering way for the whole family to welcome our new baby into the world. Thank you. Um, 18 years ago, my mom had a home birth with my little sister illegally in Virginia. Um, and thankfully, in the many years between when she was born and when I had my son two years ago, Virginia legalized CPMs, and I had a home birth two years ago. But I know in Maryland, CPM is still sort of a illegal situation, unless, I think, unless you're practicing with CNMs, I'm not really sure how it works, if it's just illegal. And I know there was legislation that was supported by a lot of delegates, and then it died. And I don't really, didn't really hear the story of how it died, so I was curious about that, how that ended up. Jeremy, I think that might be your question. <laughs> how did the bill die? So, I'll give you the really short version. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, when a bill gets introduced, you go find a delegate who cares. Our delegate is Ariana Kelly. She cares about women. She cares about having better births. Uh, she's really, really a powerful voice on her committee for this cause, and she's very dedicated to it. So we got very, very lucky um, with her. You find a delegate, and then she brings it to her committee. So she introduces the bill. We can't actually introduce a bill. A delegate has to, they call it dropping the bill. Our bill got dropped, it goes up on the internet, everybody can look at it, then we have a hearing. The chairman of the committee that the bill goes to decides what bills are gonna be heard and what bills are gonna get voted on and where they're gonna go. The chairman, that's the only person whose opinion really matters. And everybody on that committee likes the chairman because they all have 20 bills they want passed as well. So if the chairman wants something to stop, it stops. If he wants it to move forward, it moves forward. Now, the fun part about this whole game is we have two committees that this has to go to. It has to go to the Senate, and it has to go to the House. So we play this game in both places. That's, that's where lobbyists come in and lots of money. But, but basically, the short version of it is our bill got introduced. We got a hearing. Um, the nursing board, the Department of Health, the Board of Physicians all came in and, ah, this is horrible, this is going to kill babies and moms, and everything's horrible, midwives aren't professional. I mean, they said some pretty horrendous things. If you'd like the transcript, I'm happy to provide it to you. Um, the Board of Physicians straight up lied, and the physician on that committee, Dan Morheim, actually called her out on it in front of everybody. It was hilarious. But nonetheless, because all of these medical groups showed up opposed to us, in addition, MedKai and all these other, you know, groups, um, the chairman decided that it was not ready to move forward. We had the votes last year to pass our bill. There's no question. I, we could name off the delegates. We knew that they would vote for it if there was a vote, but there was never a vote. It never even went to subcommittee. Basically what happened was behind closed doors, as is usually the case, the Board of Nursing, Physicians, um, Department of Health all gathered and said, oh, well, you know, they're really not all that bad as we made them out back there. But we need to have a couple more com you know, committees and work groups, and we need to really hammer this out. And so what happened was there was an agreement struck where they killed our bill, and they had this work group that just took place. And so the same exact process is going to happen again this year. Any, the two or three things that that work group agreed on um, will be attempted to be put into the bill, and then we will put a bill in that meets our needs the consumer needs, basically, as well as trying to address all of these other needs from different groups. And we'll see how much opposition presents. And ultimately, you know, our, the lobbyist is going to try to convince the chairman and in the Senate, the chairwoman, uh, Joan Carter Collins, and her committee, that this is an important enough issue that they need to move on. And the key is that they need to vote on it. And once that vote happens, if it passes, then it moves on to the House and it moves on to the Senate for the big votes, and then the governor signs it. So. Lots of fun. It's a lot more work that has to happen and, and a lot of support needed um, for the Maryland Families for Safe Birth Organization and the Association of Independent, Independent Maryland Midwives. Maryland Midwives. <laughs> I want to 
wanted to just clarify the comment that Jeremy was referencing because I think it's worth sharing is that the, the Board of Medicine uh, representative there said, was testifying and she said, and why, why do we need midwives? We have the best maternity care, we have the best rates in the world. And the physician, who's the representative, was like, that's funny because I'm Googling it right now. And I'm, <laughs> he started reading off the countries with better maternal mortality. mortality and infant mortality rates. It's like, we're one step yeah. above Kuwait and one step yeah. below Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> How exactly is that the best? Yeah, it was, it, and it's all online, so. We have, we've briefly talked about birth outcomes um, related to women of color. I was just wondering, what are some of the issues affecting women of color as it relates to birth? Celia, I, I think you have something to say about this. Yes, I'd be happy to, to make a couple of remarks about that. As a woman of color who chose home birth, I've started questioning and thinking, why aren't there many um, other women out there, women of color, who also chose a similar route? and. This is just from personal experience and from being in my community and talking to other moms of color. Um, what I have sort of started to, to discover is that um, it used to be, of course, all women birthed outside of a hospital setting. Hospitals are a new invention that were created, I think, to serve purposes of making money for folks and insurance companies and whatnot. But women were born at, um, birthed at home. And so this is how it was for women of color and all women. Um, as we have seen, this has shifted to the medicalization of birth, and now it's become the sort of gold standard to give birth in the hospital setting, and that um, means that women of color who have struggled, I believe, to be part of this sort of higher class and to be uh, to have access to this higher standard of care now want to be part part of it because that's what Western society has sort of transfer to these women that that's what where it is the right place to give birth and this can sort of it can adversely affect immigrant women in particular which I wanted to mention because that's my background in immigrant rights advocacy is that this social stigma against the traditional way um, can make having a midwife seem as the backwards way to go so instead of going backwards let's go forward to the hospital but that's not always a, a possibility for immigrant women, particularly undocumented women who have a fear of what could happen if they go to the hospital and there's this open hostility in many parts of the country towards these women. So that leaves women with little or no choice um, as far as where to give birth. And for black women, they have been historically excluded from hospitals in the past. So there are definitely issues uh, for women of color in this in this uh, country, and that's why we need to have better access and better information given to all women so they can choose what is safest for them, not just sort of what's imported and what's uh, purveyed as the safest and best place to give birth. Can I just speak on the level of care as a woman of color that I received from the hospital and from my midwife? Um, when I walked into that hospital, as a middle class, um, married African American woman. That's not who they saw. What they saw was just some black chick with her baby daddy um, who probably has no insurance and no way to pay for this baby. And she, she probably got wicked. That's why she's so heavy. Um, there were assumptions, all of those assumptions were made. Um, most of the medical professionals who walked into that room never spoke to me. They never spoke to my husband. Um, they uh, assumed so many things about us. When, when, when um, my child was born, they wanted to do a variety of tests on him based on what they, who they thought I was, not the married woman monogamous woman that I was. Um, when I was transferred from the delivery room down to my room, I was put in a ward with several of the women. Um, I was put in a welfare ward, in spite of the fact that at the time I worked for a management consultant firm and I had excellent insurance. Um, and it wasn't until the next day when my doctor came in and they discovered I had this insurance that they moved me. Um, then a, there was a lactation consultant in the, in the hospital who came to help me learn to breastfeed my baby. And um, 
when we were having difficulty, she, she basically gave up and said, well, that's okay, sweetie, you can get formula f with WIC. Um, so, I mean, when you are faced with those kind of barriers, just um, going in, trying to have your baby. And then when I went to my midwife, um, she just got to know me. And she spent time talking to me. And um, I had a lovely birth with her at home. So. Thank you both for sharing. I'm noticing the time, and I'm noticing that we have a few more questions. Um, and I'm really wanting to get to those, so if we could move through three more questions, if everybody's willing to give us the time for three more questions, and if we can all keep that in mind as well, um, that would be terrific. All right, I'll try to keep this quick. I guess this is a question for Ryan or anyone who's looked a lot at, at the research, but whenever we are creating these sorts of studies, we have to collapse these diverse groups of people into these little categories. Be and those categories, you know, they don't tell Leslie's story or Celia's story. They, they just are these huge chunks of people. And there's no way to collapse people into categories without making lots of cultural assumptions and having biases of what kinds of people go together or what kinds of um, birth types go together. You know, just even saying like, you know, I have to check a box for you know, my short-term disability, was it a normal vaginal delivery or was it a cesarean? You know, but what is a normal vaginal delivery? That's really a pretty huge category, right? So I guess um, my question is, what were some of the assumptions that you saw in how the categories were collapsed that you found problematic um, or that you found really great in terms of actually showing the story of birth in this country? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> I feel completely underqualified to try and answer it. I'll take a brief stab and then turn to other people if they want to. Um, maybe I'll try flipping it around and saying that, uh, well, first of all, yes. <laughs> so um, research, especially statistical research, is very crude. So you can only measure very large things, like we're doing a really bad job. So it's bad enough that it shows in very large statistical sets. Um, if you want to look for things that combine research and narrative, uh, Childbirth Connections has done a series mm -hmm. of um, listening to mother surveys. And I think that's really important work because if we, if we brought the vision that mothers had of what like really mother-baby-centric um, maternity care was, that would, that would be cool, uh, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and still, like, even that vision hopefully will evolve as people realize this whole world of like greater amounts of respect, autonomy, cooperation that they could be having. Because right now, a lot of us operate with the assumption of like, the best I can do is sort of here. And th there's no vision of like, oh, it could be like this awesome, you know. Um, I feel like I wandered there a bit. What, what do other folks want to say I, about that? I don't know whether I, I can specifically answer your whole question, but I know that one of the battles that we run up against in midwife advocacy is that both sides pick which part of the a big study that they want to focus on. So for instance, the WAX report. The WAX report was done by an obstetrician. He pulled a whole bunch of information from a bunch of different studies. He pulled what he wanted from a bunch of different studies, including you know, births that I would attend in emergency births, births on the sides of highway, unplanned home births, and he compared it all, everything out of a hospital to everything in a hospital. And he said, oh, well, the neonatal death rate was three times higher. Well, no kidding. Like, that's an amazing fact. You know, when you consider every birth that happens out. But what he didn't point out in the WAX report was that the perinatal death rates were actually lower in the out-of-hospital group than they were in, in the in-hospital group. And so that everyone's understanding, perinatal is from after 20 weeks of pregnancy to, uh, I'm going to mess this up, I believe it's a month. 28 days. A month. Okay, so 20, after 20 weeks of pregnancy to 28 days, and neonatal is birth to 28 days. So perinatal is a bigger category, and it's the gold standard in research for, you know, how location affects outcome. You know, that we look at, that's how they look at it. So he picked the neonatal data and said, oh, three times higher, red flag, red flag. But what he didn't, you know, and that could be a death of a child at 27 days would count in that group. That has nothing to do necessarily with location. It could be the germ he caught at the hospital. It could be the germ he caught in the ambulance. It could be any number of things. Um, 
And so when defining that problem, when he was when he was asked, well, what about perinatal outcomes? You know, he said, oh, well, it must be because midwives are screening their clients and using lower risk women. Well, amazing statistic there, <laughs> shocker. It's exactly what they do. Um, you know, and so again, he discounted this. The other thing that's important about that is the perinatal data that he pulled, the studies that looked at perinatal data, were 300,000 births. The neonatal data was about 30,000 births. So when we're talking about a difference in, you know, Ryan talks about big batches. He chose the smaller batch because it said what he wanted to say. And obstetricians, health departments, all of the groups that oppose us, they all quote that study. When you hear home birth is associated with three times more death, that is the wax report every time. And it's just, it's a perfect example of how I could take the wax report, and I have in some of these meetings, and say, well, actually, let me show you what the wax report actually says. And I can turn it right around on the opposition. But every study has little pieces of that that you could use um, and take out of context. Thank you. Um, since coming here, I was become very interested and curious about this aim program group association and um, I was wondering what is like the big purpose of it and what have you guys um, done since your beginning to really advance your purpose that sounds so, like a question for Alexa yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you um, aim has been has grown a lot in the last couple of years and I think it's a really important voice right now in Maryland and is really exciting aim exists to um, make midwifery safer and um, to promote and protect independent midwifery in Maryland and so you know, what's really visible right now certainly is the legislative work that we're doing. We've been super involved in, um, you know, working to create access to certified professional midwives and also in the struggle to get rid of the collaborative agreement um, for certified nurse midwives to open up access to them as well. Um, but on, on the inside, we're also, you know, we're working to fill the void that's not being done in an accountable way by our state right now. So there's no accountability process for midwives right now. We need that as a community. So AIM is a place where home birth families can make a complaint against a midwife if they're not satisfied with their care and she can be reviewed by her peers and go through you know an incident review process in a professional way. It's a place where um, we do regular peer review um, just as, you know, professional building. Uh, and we're also working a lot on the transfer issue right now. And we have um, created standardized transfer forms that all the AIM midwives now use. And also a packet of information that we give to hospitals when we arrive that kind of explains a little bit about home birth and wh what's coming in, what's happening, and, and, you know, works to support that process. We're working on meeting with air, area hospitals to um, help them develop protocols for admitting home birth transfers. Um, we're working on communicating with local health departments to make vital records birth registration easier for our families, because that's a struggle for them right now. Um, when their midwife can't just fill out a form for them, they have to register their births themselves. So um, we're doing a lot of other stuff to try to improve the situation for home birth families in the meantime um, until le hopefully legislation passes. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Hi, um, I'm a UK trained midwife. And so um, in England and in most of Europe, most of the births are attended by midwives. and. Um, and until I came into America, I took that for granted. Um, I've had four children. All of them have been born at home. Since living in the States, one of the things which is my kind of uh, question to you is it's really hard um, for the vast majority of people, I think, to even know midwives are out there. I'm just amazed at like the propaganda about birth in general, how it's seen as a medical condition, um, that you know you would be tantamount to kind of child abuse by having your child anywhere other than by this by an obstetrician. How midwives are definitely second class citizens um, are um, probably not trained very well. All those kind of things that we've talked about. So my question is, how? What have you done 
so far that you felt has worked well to get your message out there as far as alternatives and like healthy alternatives, all the stuff that Ryan was talking about earlier? And then what are some things that, you know, all of us in this room and all those people that I know would love to have been in this room tonight, but I mean, I didn't even hear about the meeting until yesterday afternoon. So I just feel like there are just so many people who would want to hear this information. But unless you're kind of already kind of in the group, in the clan, like how do we get that out there to the general population? Not, you know, just to have like a, an alternative viewpoint, even if people walk away and go like, they're still crazy and I wouldn't want them, you know, to have, for people to start making informed choices rather than just having to swallow the party line, which I just feel has been just put out there for years and years by the sounds of it. And most people just have blocked out the alternative completely. Thank you so much for this question. It was tailor-made for our last question, um, which is exactly where we would have gone for the end of this, this presentation anyway, and you just asked the question for me. Thank you so much. I would like to hear from several of you up here about what it is that we're doing and, and how that we're making this difference. Um, who would like to go first? I'd like to bring up one thing yes. that I think has really helped, not only in our state, but all over the country, is um, birth circles are popping up everywhere. Um, we have several of them in Maryland. I know uh, I live out in the Frederick County area. There's a very large home birthing community in the, in the um, Frederick County area. There's also a large group of people who would love to see midwives in the hospitals, who would love to go to the hospitals, and, and we just don't have the midwives out there. And so these birth circles are just community groups. It's just moms are, that are getting together and they invite professionals to come in. They invite midwives, doulas, childbirth educators. They hold their, their monthly meetings. I know that Frederick, um, years ago, Robin and I had a birth circle in Frederick and then it kind of uh, went away and now recently it, it started up this past year. And the first meeting I went to, there were over 30 people in the room. The room was so crowded that we, we all started talking immediately about getting a bigger space. So I think the, it, they want the information on women, couples, families, young families want that information and they're just looking for any way to get it. So I think that's a really good way to, to start spreading the word. Um, so I'll let others speak to their ideas too. So, so on this, I just wanted to clarify, mm -hmm. community-based resource centers, and they are created by you and me. Mm -hmm. we, we get an idea and we say, hey, let's do this. Let's invite all the people we know and they can invite all the people they know. And then we all come together and we talk about not just home birth, we talk about hospital birth. We talk about how to avoid interventions in hospital birth, how to find a midwife. How far do you have to go to find a midwife to serve you in a hospital? And can you get into that practice because you're out of county? You know, all of these different things are shared in those community-based organizations. And if you don't have one in your area, contact one of us and we will be more than glad to share with you how to create it. Because that is one thing on the grassroots level that is making a huge difference for lots and lots of people. Thank you, Liz. Can I say that um, you don't have to start a community group. You can just talk to people. Mm -hmm. I tell everybody about my home birth um, to the point that people in my church now, they see me come and they just run the other way because they don't want to know. <laughs> um, but I've had conversations in grocery stores and um, at church, at uh, sporting events with my kids. I just, you know, I just talk about it. And once you start talking about it and it becomes a normal part of your conversation, um, it's funny, my kids talk about it too now. Mm -hmm. And my, my teenage son will, you know, they had, he was in a youth group and a conversation of turned to sex and, um, it, and um, they were talking about babies and it came up in his youth group. So then I had some of his teenage friends asking me about having babies at home. Um, so, I mean, if, the more you talk about it, the more people know. You just tell anybody. So, so that's about normalizing birth yes. and normalizing midwifery. So for all those people that came up to you when you were pregnant in the grocery store and said, oh, honey, get the epidural as soon as you get to the hospital. You'll feel so much better. You know, let's, let's change that. Let's change normal. Have you ever thought about a midwife or about home birth? I'd be glad to tell you about it. <laughs> how wonderful my birth was. And no, it didn't hurt like that. It isn't like those, yeah. those TV shows. Let me tell you about it. So normalizing birth, and that's another way of doing it, talking to your friends. 
Just to add on to that, a, an easy way to do that is to join some of the organizations that you've learned about here tonight and follow their news feeds and share their articles that they publish on social media sites. I know that's what I do. Then I get questions from people of, you know, is this really true or what have you heard about that? And so just spreading the word through social media can be helpful. And um, on a personal level, I always make a note to sort of message or talk to everybody who I know who gets pregnant. Hey, I had a home birth. If you have questions, let me know. Just so there's an option of somebody to talk to that's somewhat normal that they can feel that they can confide in. Um, so I, I, you know, a lot of times, People will throw it out on a listserv that I'm that I um, am a member of that they're pregnant and you know introducing themselves to the neighborhood and I'll say I'm a home birth mom. You have questions, come to me. If you want to know about breastfeeding, I'm here. Um, most of the times I don't get a response, but if I do, that's one more baby who maybe has a chance of having a safer out of hospital birth with a midwife in hospital if they choose, but with a midwife. Again, sharing your experience, normalizing birth, normalizing midwifery, normalizing breastfeeding. You know, all of those really major important things. So who I else wants a, to add to our I list? I work in a firehouse uh, yeah. with a bunch of type A personality guys who are terrified of birth. <laughs> right. And um, when I go off on my phone, and usually I, I go off on my phone for probably on a 24-hour shift, I'm usually talking to somebody on this panel <laughs> um, and a few other people in the room, at least 12 of those hours. Um, they, they're, they're a common theme is they'll be like, oh, Galvin's off midwifing. And... Uh, it started off as this joke that, oh, Jeremy, he just, he does all this birth stuff. You know, he eats placentas and he, he, <laughs> he, he promotes breastfeeding and he does all this crazy stuff and, uh, you know, all this stuff. And, um, and recently, this has been going on for three years almost for me. Um, now guys in the firehouse are coming to me asking me questions about their wives who are pregnant. <laughs> and they'll do it really quietly. They're like, hey, I got a question. Like, Doctor said this, is this true? And, and, you know, and, it's, and I feel really humbled to be able to, you know, again, share stories and just let people know that this is a normal thing. Um, people are starting to say, wow, this isn't so crazy. You know, yeah, Galvin's wife had a home birth. You know, it's no big deal. You know, um, that's a big deal in a, in a firehouse where there's one paramedic and he believes it's safe and all these other firefighters, you know, respect that opinion. And so we change people by telling our stories and by, you know, spreading truth. Um, I was talking to a, a couple of young women at my church the other day. Same thing. They were like, wow, what you, you know, they're friends on Facebook. I post things about home birth and what Maryland Families for Safe Birth is doing on Facebook. They see it. They ask me questions. Um, that's the way we're going to get people to understand this. You know, I would encourage all of you, as I'm going to shamelessly plug our organization, stop by our table, take a card. At the very least, take a card. Take a brochure. Take something with you that has our phone number on it. Ask me for my cell phone. You know, I will give you my cell phone number. Call us. We will put anybody who wants to help to work. Um, we have so much to do, and it's, it's not to scare you and say, oh, we'll make you work 24 hours a day, but we will give you as much as you can take on, you know, and we'll ask you sometimes to do a little more. But, um, you know, we, the important part, I think the biggest thing that people can do is just learn and, you know, Know what your rights are. When you go into a hospital, if you don't believe in home birth and you go to the hospital, know what it says on that patient bill of rights. Mm -hmm. Know what it says, because number four or seven, depending on which hospital you're in, it says you can refuse anything you want. Know that one. I knew a lady who wrote it on a card, and every time she wanted to refuse something, she had 20 cards with her, <laughs> and she would hand that card when they would give her trouble to the nurse or the OB and just, you know, <laughs> item number four on the patient bill of rights, I can refuse anything I want. And just, and they stopped, they stopped giving her trouble after that, <laughs> you know. So, you know, definitely, you know, join up with our effort. There's Maryland Friends and Midwives also, who does a lot of education. Um, we work very close together. AIM, all three of our groups work very close together. And, and just be part of the Facebook community, part of our network. And that's, that's a great way to kind of, you know, get the word out. So to add to that, Valerie is here somewhere, and she is an event coordinator. She might even be out manning our table or womaning our table right now. Um, she's an event coordinator with Maryland Families for Safe Birth and she goes to events like this and she sets up our table and she has a computer and she collects petition signatures and she signs you up to receive our newsletter. And there she is. So <laughs> when we're done in here, please see Valerie. If you don't get our newsletters, sign up for them. If you haven't yet signed our petition, please sign the petition that's asking our, legislat our legislators to license certified professional midwives in Maryland to give us more access to midwifery. We okay. signed it last year. Do we need to sign it again? 
Well, there, there has been more than one petition out. So please, if you, if you don't know that you've signed it like within the last year, go ahead and sign it again. It is not going to accept your signature twice. So you're not going to be frauding anything. <laughs> and can I also just say that um, it, it has been very clear to me for the past uh, 25 years, if it hasn't been clear to you all, that this is a very political um, issue. So when, uh, you know, when your local candidates come to you and say, what are the issues you care about, please say midwifery and, and, and the choice to make your own choice about where and with whom your baby's gonna be born. And you know, that goes all the way up to the governor. So um, we actually do have a, a gubernatorial candidate who supports midwifery, Heather Masur. She was one of the first ones in Annapolis to take up our, um, our efforts. So, um, but you can, you can ask every candidate to be aware of this issue. So um, I, all three of my delegates they know my name, <laughs> so you could do that. An, an, an excellent point. If you are a Maryland citizen or anywhere that you are, get to know your delegates. Tell them what's important to you, whether it has to do with midwives or, you know, land disputes or you know whatever whatever's going on in your life. Let them know what's important to you and have them work for you. And right now, what's important to us is midwives. So let's talk to them about midwives. And you've all helped today create what we hope will be a useful tool in doing that. So uh, if you sign up on the Maryland, uh, Maryland um, Families for Safe Birth, uh, you'll get notified when we've got the PowerPoint and the video up and all these things. And they're just free open source stuff. So you can take it. You can give the talk yourself. You can show the slides that you think are important to your friends. You can call your legislator and say, I want you to watch this video. You know, whatever. So thank you. Yeah, so you're all part of history here tonight. So thank you all for being part of history tonight and, and making this video with us. And I can talk loudly. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Thank you.